hey guys it's me it's shannon it's another episode of sheepless needles vegan podcast not about being vegan where we do all sorts of fun stuff like we talk about knitting we talk about gaming we talk about reading we talk about bonnets we talk about cats we talk about life menopause you know the whole nine yards but most importantly let's get the brew on guys hello i don't know if i've had this on stream before or not but this is yellow springs brewery out of yellow springs ohio and this is their creative space new england ipa i have had this before i already know i love it so let's just Let's pour ourselves a beverage. It's happy wear. Happy wear? Happy wear. It's happy wear somehow. It's happy hour somewhere. And that somewhere is in the basement of my house. Oh, unnecessary foam because of the way I'm pouring this. All you beer people out there are like, blasphemy, why must you pour your beer like a moron? Because I like the sound effects. That's why. You mind yours, I'll mind mine. Okay, guys, it's been it's it's been a minute. It's been a while. Life has been a little crazy. If you are on Ravelry, you probably know the extent of like what's been going on and why I'm not really filming a lot. Um, but I'm just gonna shortly tell you what's going on and and move on from there. So my husband Steve and I ran a rabbit rescue for about 15 years, um, give or take, and we have three remaining bunnies behind me from said rescue. These are the sanctuary rabbits. Um, we have Harriet in the middle there. She's a duchy. These two, upper and lower, are her sons. That's Lebo on the top, who is eating pellets like a madman. And then we have one ear below, also eating pellets. One ear is free run today, but a lot of times he just hangs out in this house. They're weird like that. Anyway, those are the bunnies. Love them dearly. We lost three recently. I previously, on previous recordings, you would have seen rabbits be directly behind me, and that was our geriatric senior ward. Um, we have lost all three of them uh, within two weeks of each other. I think that we knew when we lost one, the other two would be pretty quickly behind them. They were... At least Harvey and Orwell, who were brothers, were born at our house. They were 13 and a half. Guys, that's a long and happy and healthy life for a rabbit. Most people don't get to see their rabbits past 10 um, here because I think for a multitude of reasons, um, our bunnies tend to live to about 12 or 13. We've been very lucky. Um, we've got great vet care. And all of that goes to say uh, knowledge is power. And in case of rabbit care, arm yourself with as much knowledge as you can and arm yourselves with a vet who specializes in exotics, particularly rabbits, and your rabbit will live a much longer and happier life than had you not. So do your homework, rabbit.org. I'll put it in the notes. Anyway, I'm going to dedicate this episode to all the senior rabbits out there, but in particular, my three who passed, and that would be Harvey, his brother Orwell, and their partner Nano. I love you three dearly. I know you're running and binking in fields of cilantro and basil and dandelion greens with my cat Stella. And cheers. Oh my God. The beauty of this beer, you guys. It's funny, I'm wearing a Toxic Brew, which is another brewery in Dayton. Fabulous brewery in Dayton. Um, so I'm just representing Dayton. Hello. Okay, so what have you guys been doing? I haven't talked to you in so long. I want to know what's going on with your lives. Since I last talked, so much has happened. Beyonce's new album is out, Renaissance. It is fabulous. I'm in love with the song named Cuff. I sing it constantly. Go listen to it. It it is just it's 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 what I needed. So Thank you, Queen Bee, for completing my life this weekend. That's what I've been doing, apparently. 
What about you? Are you knitting? Are you crocheting? Are you crafting? Are you cooking? Dudes, there is somebody in our vegan knitting and crochet group on Ravelry who is also on Instagram who bakes. And when I tell you that I'm going to have to unfollow her because I'm going to be way out of control with my eating, dude, the pies and the cakes are insane. I will see if it's okay. I'm sure she would be okay. I don't know. I will check to see if she's okay with me putting her Instagram in the show notes. I don't want to do that to somebody without asking permission because that can be pretty aggressive. Um, but anyway, dude, the cakes and the cookies and everything, wow, she is insane. So what have you been doing? Have you been following her? Do you know who I'm talking about? If not, we'll figure it out. Um, I have not done a lot of crafting, I have to be honest. I've been doing noggin crafting. I've been trying to get myself back into mental gear. The world is a little nutty. The world is a lot nutty. It's very angering. And I am trying to channel my rage in a productive manner that will help elicit change in the positive direction that we need it to. Because we need it to, dudes. So when we last were together, I don't even know if I had cast on my open edge tea or not. It's Jessie Made Designs, editor, photo, open edge tea. Here's a disclaimer. Mine looks nothing like the photos. And why is that, you ask? Because somehow, once again, I've shanified a pattern and I don't know how I did it. Now, sometimes that will make me very sad. This time, don't really care. I like it, don't care what anyone else thinks, and kind of, that's just where I'm at. So let's grab it. It is on my Addy Rocket Squared Needles. Could not tell you the size needles I'm using right now, um, but I know they're not to pattern. <laughs> um, It'll be on my Ravel, uh, my Ravelry information is somewhere on my YouTube channel. It's, I have a project started with notes, so you can go look. But anyway, I am also using, this is, let's get up in here. Can you see that? Okay. This is Trailhead Yarns, Appalachian Trail. It is some type of cotton blend, I want to say with nylon. Not a lot of nylon though, like 6% maybe. Show notes, Appalachian Trail. Couldn't I tell you the colorway on this? Bad something? Bad mama, maybe? I, I don't remember. Anyway, I got it during their off sale. So I had two skeins of it. I'm on the second one. And you probably want to see what the hell I'm knitting on, right? Instead of me just blah, 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 blah. Like the Peanuts teacher. Um, so let's let's do this. Let's figure out how to do this. Okay, so it is a V-neck. I have obviously these are the front. I'm working on the back here. So once the back is knit up, I seam the shoulders. You add the arms, and then you're done, right? So already I can tell you a couple things that have varied from the pattern for reasons that I am not actually aware of. And I'm sure somebody in the show notes will be like, bitch, this is what you're doing wrong. And I'll be like, girl, you're right. And guess what? Mm, I don't care right now. So the first thing I'm going to show you, and I'm going to try to show this to you, is the hemline. Now it is a one by one rib in the round. Okay, hopefully you guys can see that because I'm kind of blocking my view of the monitor a little bit. But my rib is like an open rib. It is not, you know, coming back together. It has, there's not elasticity to my ribbing. The 13 year old in me is about ready to come out. Okay, and then this part of the pattern where it's like the open right here, um, it's much longer then the pat like everyone's photos are really tight and compact and like I must be and this is the weirdest part about this I must be a really loose knitter 
which I find really funny because when I'm stressed out, I'm like a little, but somehow knitting, hey, this speaks to the calming nature of knitting because apparently it calms me down to the point where my tension is like that, right? One too many beers at the after party. That's my tension. <laughs> that's the title of this episode. One too many beers at the after party. Okay, so then the other thing that's different is somehow my V is very much longer than everyone else's photo. And I'm following the pattern, right? I am I measured the armpit hole. And again, I can already tell you. And the weird thing, I don't know why. I didn't go up in needle size. I went down. So you would have thought it would have shrunk row-wise, not elongated. I have no, couldn't tell you. Now it's cropped no matter what. So I'll be wearing it with a tank top. So it really doesn't matter. But I'm just, I don't know if it's, if it's, oh, I do know. It's just me. I was going to say, I don't know if it's the yarn. I don't no. Let, let's be real. Let's just take a swig and be real for a second. Guys, I'm a crappy knitter. I'm not good, but I love it. And at the end of the day, I really don't care if I'm a crappy knitter. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'll wear what I knit. And the re I think really, if you were to say, hey, Shannon, you know, when you knit, what are the things that you, that you excel at? Well, I'm just going to tell you, shawls. I love them. I love different patterns. I love the di the use of different stitches. I like learning new things. Garments don't tend to have that effect on me in the same way that a shawl does. And for garments, guys, I'm just not good at them. And I'm going to get better because I'm going to keep working at it. I'm going to keep doing them because I want stuff to wear. But yeah, not my forte. So like there are some knitters out there, vegan knitters in particular, who are just fabulous, who churn out garments like no one's business. You know who you are, this orange couch, Kate. Um, Allie in sweatpants would be another one. Um, they're just, I, you know, fabulous people doing fabulous things. And I'm not that. So if you're tuning in for like someone who's churning out quality knitwear, if you're tuning in for quality knitwear on this podcast, you've had one too many beers at the after party, my friend. And I support you. So, okay. So that's that's where I'm at with the Open Edge Tea by Jesse May Designs. I will, once again, all of this will be in the show notes. All of this is on my Ravelry page. That is what I've been knitting on. I have been having to go out of town a little bit. And so I've taken that with me and I found that I will, hi, one ear. What are you doing, bud? I will knit on it in an airport and on a plane. But once I got to my destination, I just, I couldn't because my brain had other things going on, which, you know, whatever. So it'll get done. Uh, will it be done by the next time I podcast? I don't know, because my podcasting is going to be super sporadic depending on whether I'm home or not. Um, and I suppose I could always film a podcast on my iPhone if I'm out of town, but the, the reality is the reason why I'm going out of town is is something that is emotionally really difficult and um, exhausting. And I don't know that I would have the right energy or the right mindset for a podcast. And I don't, you know, I'm not here to make people sad. I'm here to make people question why they're watching YouTube. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, she's back. Okay, so in the spirit of knitting, um, of course, you know, I love to buy yarn. And you guys, um, Terrapin Fiberworks, show notes. I don't know what to say. Her Garden Club yarn is fabulous. And I got another shipment of it. And I'm doing her Potomac base in the shipment, which is, it. I think it's 75 cotton, 25 linen. I love cotton blends. I love them. They're my favorite blend to work with. So here we go. This is, oh, is that blowing out a little bit? Well, no, actually, that's pretty, that's not bad. Okay, so it's blowing out a little bit. It's a little bit darker than what's what's showing, sorry. Um, this is white peach. You guys, come, come on. Let's get you a close-up of her tag. Oh, maybe do it right side up, Shannon. 
Is that fo okay, I don't have my glasses on, you guys, and I'm looking at my monitor, and I don't know if that's focused or not because I can't see. <laughs> Terrapin Fiber Works. All right, the second yarn that came is called Onion, Onion, which always reminds me of Arrested Development. I'm just saying. Onion. You guys, she, I, I mean, every, everything I've gotten from her, um, I've absolutely loved. I don't know if you remember the spiraling cable shawl that I knit, and maybe we'll put a photo up here. That was her Chesa Chesapeake DK base, which is 100% cotton. And I forget the colorways I used. It's just wonderful. And the thing that I was really worried about is, I mean, the, the bases that I use, or not the base, but the, the colorways that I used on the spiraling cables were really deeply saturated. And I was super concerned that one, it was going to show up on my fingers like hair dye, or two, that when I went to wash it or soak it, whatever, that it was going to bleed. Didn't. And I just, you know, and I was using deep berry tones. Like, I, I don't know. I am very much impressed with everything that I've gotten. I need to adjust. Hold the line. Here we go. Um, very much impressed. I think if you have been on the fence with trying her yarn, just do it. Just do it. You won't be disappointed. The other um, thing that I got in the mail was my... Uh, yarn club from peach peachy yarn club from bzy peach and i have yeah i'm collecting all of these because this is a subscription so it's one skein a month i think is the one that i did and i'm collecting them all before i do a project but i'm going to do a project solely with her yarns um i have nothing but positive things to say about my experience with this yarn club and i if you have not um, she does a really funny thing called Saturday morning shenanigans on Instagram. And I will, I'll, I'll link her stuff in the show notes. I just, you guys, I really enjoy her. I think she is such a force of support for other creators and small business owners. And particularly with small business owners, I think you, you need someone who is going to boost your signal. And I think she does that in such an organic and wonderful way. So check her out. Anyway, here's the, oh, glare. Sorry, guys. But this one, you look how fun. It's just fun. I just love it. Don't have my glasses on, so I can barely focus, but this is 100% Pima cotton. It's DK weight. I think the colorway is soft and light, but I can very barely focus. I probably need to put my glasses on. So anyway, came with that this month in stitch markers. She always puts a little something in there. There have been wax melts. There's been lip balm. I mean, I, I just, I really have enjoyed it. Um, I will probably continue to do her yarn club, but I may change and like she does a mini skein one and then she does a full skein one. So I, I don't know. I'll play around with that next year. Um, if you guys have anybody doing vegan bases and vegan dyeing that you would recommend that I haven't hit, I mean, I know um, there's Birdie Knits who I've used. I think if you remember my Versa Cowl, that was um, Universal Yarn and Birdie Knits. And Birdie Knits was the really beautiful speckled in there, which was Emmeline, which was an anniversary colorway. I... 100% loved that. But if you guys have used anybody else that's an independent, like small business, as opposed to like a Lion brand or a Premier or a big box brand, put it in the show notes and share it. Um, because I really, I think it's really important to support vegans wherever they are. And even if, like, let me put this out there. I don't know if the woman who does BZY Peach or Terrapin Fiberworks, I don't know if they're vegan in their personal life, but they're offering a really great vegan product to the public, and I'm willing to support that um, 100%. I think anybody who is trying to get vegan products out there, I'm not here to question someone's personal life and their personal choices, 
But if they're doing something that I feel like has value and can support somebody in the crafting world that is vegan, I will absolutely 100% support it. So I always try when I talk about things on the podcast to make sure that they are vegan and typically they are. Um, and if they're not, I will, there'll be a disclaimer there if I specifically know what, what the deal is. So anyway, show notes, comment, let me know, you know, anybody you guys want to signal boost that, you know, doing vegan yarns, vegan colorways, whatever it is, put it, put it in there and then we'll compile a list and I'll talk about it in future episodes. Hmm. I almost forgot in my farmer's market, uh, Terrapin Fiber Works, I got stitch markers too, and they were underneath my beer. So I'm going to try to get up there. Oh, folk. I can't tell if it's focused. Very sorry. It's trying. But the stitch markers are so cute. And you can order with the Terrapin Fiber Works, just so you know. If you don't want to do a club box, like if you don't need any more notions, you can order just the skein of yarn or you can order the club box and get it um, with the stitch markers. So typically what I do is I order one just skein and then one club box because she does two colorways when she does it. So check her out, show notes. I think I'm just repeating myself, which means, you know, beer. And that's the knitting portion. So like if you want to hang out for, obviously you're not just here for knitting because I suck at knitting. So let's just keep going. Um, I want to talk about deodorant. <laughs> there was no transition there and I don't really care. And why do I want to talk about deodorant? Because as a vegan, here, here's what is annoying to me. It's okay. It's not annoying. Let me just, just go with me on this journey. Like for some reason, people tend to think that vegan means like all natural, no science. And I don't like when it comes to body care, like clean beauty, which guys, there's not, it doesn't exist. Right. And what I mean by that is with deodorant, they're like, rub this rock hard pound of like baking soda in your armpit. Voila, vegan deodorant. Okay, I want to tell you my journey with vegan deodorant and and what what has happened to me. Now, a disclaimer, I'm a very active person. I drink a shit ton of water and I sweat a lot when I work out. So I perpetually am, am like unloading or cleaning my sweat glands, so to speak, as I sweat. For people who are less active, my recommendations may not work. So just, just keep that in mind. Um, so my journey with vegan deodorant started like most people. I went to a health food store trying to find vegan deodorant. At the time, I think the only thing I could find was a company called Jason Natural and Kiss My Face. This is probably... God, I can't even tell you how many years ago this was, a long ass time ago. Neither of which worked on me. Like literally within hours, I was stinky and I, whatever. So I kept going back and trying different brands. And I don't know when Schmidt's deodorant came out at the health food store. Originally, I could only buy it online. And I can't even tell you how I found Schmidt's, but... It only came in a glass jar and you had to like, you know, scoop it, whatever. I liked it. It worked, but I had a really bad reaction to the baking soda in it where I started getting huge sores. I mean, huge sores and a rash in my, around my armpit and it was painful. And then I couldn't wear deodorant at all. So I would go through, if you name a vegan deodorant, I can guarantee you I've probably tried it. So... In my journey of deodorant, like then it turned into, okay, now I need to find something for sensitive skin. And the issue I would run into, then you would get into these like really oily deodorants that would work for a couple hours, but certainly not long haul. And if you're somebody who goes into an office for eight hours, like really, are, if you're one of the people that brings your toothbrush to work, bully for you, because I'm not that person. So no, I'm not going to reapply deodorant on my lunch at work. Like uh, that's not my lifestyle. So I've been on this ever quest for, oh, callback ever quest for, um, 
a deodorant that doesn't need to be reapplied, that doesn't make my armpit turn into a red rash from hell, and that, you know, is pleasant to use and doesn't damage my clothing. And that, okay, that's the other thing. I would find one that would work and it would ruin my clothes. Like there would be oil, like just, and you know what I'm talking about. Now, some people would say, just don't wear deodorant. Well, I'm not here to be the stinky vegan in the room. Like, I know, I know that when I'm in a room, I'm probably the only vegan there and I am representing the entire vegan community to those people. So if I stink, vegans will be stinky to that person for the rest of their life. I know that. It sucks, it's not true, but that's the way it is. So I wanna talk about some products that I have found that I've really liked. Why is this taking so long, Shannon? Okay, so anyway, guys, there's a company out there that sponsors podcasts all over the place. You know who they are. I'm not even going to go into it. I, listen, I'm glad that it works for all of you influencers, strangely enough, who get kickbacks. But uh, it did not work for me. And one, way overly scented to the point that like raising my arm, I'd be like, what am I smelling? And I'm like, oh my God, it's my deodorant. That that is not the experience of deodorant that I want to have. I don't want to move my arm and be like, whoa, why am I smelling mulberry and tea? Why am I smelling a vanilla cupcake? Dudes, I don't want to smell it at all. I don't mind if it's scented, but I don't know. I don't need to fill an, an elevator with the scent of like cucumber mint. I'm just saying. So wait, yeah, too over scented. And honestly, my my gauge of whether something is working or not is like, I'll put it on in the morning, I will work through the day, I'll sleep, I'll get up and I will work out. I do not reapply. When I am done working out, I can tell how well that deodorant held up with how stink I am, stinky I am. And obviously, after a workout, there's going to be a little bit of odor, right? So keep that in mind. <clears throat> so I have found... Now, this isn't going to be for everybody, but I do want to plug them. I am not sponsored in any way, shape, or form. But the company is called Pit Liquor. And originally, when I saw it, I was like, okay, I how can I not purchase something called Pit Liquor? <laughs> it's Sheepless Needles Who Drinks. So I got it, and I got their whiskey. They What the basis is, they use alcohol, like whiskey, rum, and vodka, and then they scent it. And the whiskey lavender literally has lavender in it. Um, you guys, this is the one thing that I will tell you has worked for me spot on. You spray it in your armpits, like four to five in each armpit. I'm going to tell you 24 hours later, after a workout, I might have minor or odor, but I'm about ready to get in the shower. It kills the bacteria. The alcohol kills the bacteria that causes odor. That's all you need to know. So I'm just saying, give it a whirl. The other thing I found, I found this at Target and I got it because I needed to hop on a plane. I was like, well, I'm not taking my pit liquor because it's glass. Okay, that's the downside. That's the con to pit liquor. It is glass. It would be hard to travel with. They do a roll-on, but I'm going to tell you guys, don't do the roll-on. Get the spray. All right, so this is raw sugar. I don't... I, oh, where are my glasses? Oh, I, I can't even see. Okay, so this does not have aluminum, baking soda, talc, parabens, or poly, pro, propylene glycol. It's in cardboard, so it's biodegradable, which, you know, I like like that. This is vanilla bean and charcoal and when I tell you this is such a Shannon scent and you just push it up with your finger um this has worked really well now I will say I'm slightly more stinky after my workout in the morning however absolutely holds up during the day now neither of these guys are antiperspirants you're still gonna sweat which is very important to clean your pores so those two have worked. One you can get online, one you can get at Target. The other thing I have not tried yet, I just got it, is this. 
I don't know if you can see this. This is Hurrah. They do lip balms, which I use religiously. I love them. But this is their deodorant. I think this is a very similar concept if you are familiar. Aluminum tubing comes with a key. Um, oh, I'm sorry. You buy the key separately. So you can recycle it. Um, that's the other thing that's super important to me when I'm buying this stuff. I am trying to get rid of plastic as best I can. Um, and honestly, out of the three of these, the pit liquor is probably the most sustainable because you can buy a huge refill in a bottle that's reusable, not inexpensive, but will last you a long time. So what I would tell you is probably get a sample pack, figure out the scent you like, and then buy the bottle. Um, I will let you know about the Hurrah deodorant, but I think it's probably pretty similar to Lume. I don't know if you've heard of that. There's a huge like internet advertising campaign for that. I have tried Lume. It is a little bit too medicinally smelling for my taste. It did work. It does work. But the actual scent of it just, it wasn't overpowering. Like other people couldn't smell it, but it just was not a pleasant experience for me. And it comes in plastic. And I'm like, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to waste. I'm not here to kill the planet, guys. All right, so I don't know how Steve can edit this whole thing down where I'm not talking about deodorant for 30 minutes. So there you go. That's my spiel on deodorant. Go try them. If you have any recommendations, put them in the comments. I'm just going to tell you my pick for right now is pit liquor. Okay, guys. Oh. Hmm. Come on, you want to say hi to everybody? I bet they'd like to see you. Oh, look who it is, you guys. That's not a bunny. That's a Maggie. We'll see where she stays. Okay, so let's move on to literature for your literature, which I will need my glasses for. So you guys, I, sorry for the glare, but I need to be able to read. I have supported many a Kickstarter over the year. And most of the Kickstarters that I support are Dungeons and Dragons related. So I do dice Kickstarters. I do, you know, RPG, like role-playing game Kickstarters. And I have done one, two, three, three. I got two of them in the mail. I'm going to talk about one right now called Nightfell and then by Mana Project Studios. And then I will... I'm going to shortly discuss the other, well, we'll get into it. Anyway, Nightfell. Here's the deal. I love myself some Dungeons and Dragons, and I actually am one of the people who likes funny Dungeons and Dragons. And You try to talk into the mic? Um, and by that, what I mean is I like a sense of humor. So for me, I... I like to take a serious situation and have it broken by a character who's just a little bit silly. And an example with that would be like, and it was totally by accident, but my husband had put together a, I don't even know what rule set. I think it was old school D&D, &D, the basic rule set, well before 5e. And I was an acrobat rogue, I think. And I don't know if it was even called a rogue. But we, it was a pretty heavy situation that we had gone into where we had like gone into a temple, got screwed over by this monk. And anyway, lots of things were dying. And my character, for whatever reason, being an acrobat, should be able to like sneak and like, you know, traverse areas in a way that normal people who were not acrobats could not. Except for the life of me, every time I would roll for one of my acrobatic checks, I would fail it every fucking time. I don't think my character ever passed a saving throw in terms of acrobatics. Like, I failed every single one. So it'd be like, you know, there's, you're trying to sneak around on the upper rafters, like, you know, doing round bouts and cartwheel, whatever. And I would fall flat on the floor. Like, or I would knock into something and, and we would be discovered every friggin' time. So it became like a, almost like a comic relief for a pretty dark campaign where my character was just not able to do what they were supposed to do. So anyway. Okay, so that's the kind of D&D &D that, I, that I love, where there, it's broken up a little bit. My husband loves Grimdark. 
like anything grimdark. And grimdark is basically what it sounds like if you're not familiar. It's just n very bleak, a lot of death, and like virtually no hope, right? And so it's a landscape that is pretty heavy. And you have to be kind of mentally prepared to do a campaign like that. You can't just invite your friends over for a grand dark campaign and think it's going to go well. So you, it's definitely something you have to have a session zero for session zeros where you kind of talk about, hey, I'm OK with this in a campaign. Hey, I'm not OK with this in a campaign so that everybody's on the same page so that when you come to the table and play, nobody is being triggered or traumatized by what's being discussed. And, you know, like really simple rules, like a lot of people and, and most people will probably talk about this, but like the simplest one I can think of is like no harm to children. Like that's something that would be a normal session zero thing to talk about. So anyway, like if you watch The Witcher, you know what I'm talking about. Like there's a lot of baby death in that. And that can be very triggering for a lot of reasons to a lot of people. So anyway, session zeros are important. Night fell. <clears throat> I'm grabbing it now, is a really interesting world that I'll talk about more on future podcasts because I just got the book and I haven't really dug in that deeply. I don't know glare wise if you can see this. Look at that. Now this is, I think I did their legendary bundle. So instead of getting separate books for the bestiary, kind of like the player's guide and then the DM's guide. It's all in one book, um, which I love. And it's a beautiful book. Um, it is a world where lunar cycles are super important because events and beasties and characters have different abilities depending on the lunar cycle. And it's I love that, but it is a world that is v like very grim and basically there's a lot of death and there's a lot of rotting, a lot of dying, a lot of just hell, basically. I am very excited to dig into this, um, but just to show you, like this is just the artwork. Just on the opening of the book, right? I mean, come on. Who doesn't want to explore a world like that, right? Let me see if I can find you something. Oh, glare. Sorry, I'm going to try to tilt this. I mean, just really great artwork. I mean, the artwork, Mana Project Studios, the artwork. I don't know if I've worn them on the podcast, but they did a clothing, a Cthulhu clothing line Kickstarter that I did. And I got hoodies and I got t-shirts. The artwork is just fabulous. Um, oh my God. You got Oh, oh, glare. Uh, this is very, okay. Do I go? Uh, no. Okay. Can you see it? <laughs> so beautiful. So in the spirit of like, hey, do you want to hear something creepy? Let's do something creepy. Let's. Let's read together a la Vincent Price. A creepy beastie that you will encounter in your, in your, you know, exploring the world that we, that is created in this book. And, um, I don't really know how to pronounce the name of the world. It's Ermin, I Ermin. So in true Sheepless Needles fashion, I will butcher everything that I'm talking about. So we are going to talk today, boys and girls. Ladies and gents and all in between and outside of, we're going to talk about the lunar predator. Hmm. The lunar predator. I'm just going to go out on a limb here, guys. Probably not somebody you want to run into. Just saying. So the lunar predator is one of the most abject evils ever perpetrated 
by the witch covens of ermine during the lunar age. Um, oh, yeah. And it was meant to channel the pure energies of the pale star to generate something that has absolutely nothing pure about it. Esoteric experiments and cruel curses against wild beasts deep in the Wailing Marshes gave birth to a spawn of lethal predators whose strength and ferocity increases under moonlight. All right, so dudes, I, what do you do when you're in perpetual moonlight? You're screwed. Because these guys are not your friend. Ruthless and cunning, powerful be be beings bleh, that their own creators have learned over time to fear. So like basically it's kind of like Terminator, right? Where Skylab was like, oops, yikes, now we need to run for the hills. That's what the lunar predator is. So they are paragon hunters. Few horrors are feared by night travelers as much as the lunar predator. And rumors of settlements or even entire villages raised to the ground by these monsters are not uncommon. They are walking nightmares and everything living and non-living, humanoid and monstrous is prey for them. So like basically you're screwed no matter what you are or who you are if you run into a lunar predator. <clears throat> Good luck. And. Why do I picture Ted Cruz as the lunar predator? I'm just saying. Threats under the full moon. So any warden of the dead or sentry who watches over the barriers of the outpost fears the night of the full moon. As these huge monstrosities are said to gain, gain strength from it and are even able to gather it and unleash it all at once. So basically, if it's a full moon, these guys go into like Hulk mode is essentially what they're saying. Taking down one of these creatures and taking their spoils with them as a trophy is a source of glory for the settlement that has succeeded in the enterprise. Well, I would guess because I'm just going to guess that not too many people or monster, whoever you are, have ever killed a lunar predator and or even live to tell about seeing one. So they're solitary and dominant. They're extremely territorial. It is not uncommon to see one. It is not at all common to see one and almost no one has ever lived to tell it. And it is said that they have a well-defined hunting territory and that they prove po hostile even to their own kind who should trespass. Possessing a mouse that is not proper to other beasts in the phases of the new moon or during the day, they tend to stay in their lair, being aware or aware of being stronger when the moon illuminates the sky. In addition, they seem to want to sow as much terror as possible, as if to leave evident traces of the devastation they can cause so as to drive away the intruders and intimidate those who intend to hunt them down when the absence of the moon makes them vulnerable. So basically, this is a predator that if the moon is out, you're fudged, you're screwed, you're welcome for self edited myself. Um, here's their stat block. So in case you just want to incorporate this into any game you have, I love the idea that you've got this predator that if it's daylight or if it's a new moon where there is no moon at night, that their vulnerabilities are expounded. And that when there is moonlight or it is a full moon, these guys are on full friggin blast. I mean, how much fun would that be to play with during a campaign? So anyway, their armor class is 18. They have 189 hit points. They can move 50 feet. These guys can move. Um, okay, so when there is no moonlight, they are vulnerable to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical weapons. So are they not vulnerable to magic? Oh, okay. So when it is, normally when there is some type of moonlight, they are resistant to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from weapons that aren't magical. Oh. Okay. So you would have to have a magical weapon during moonlight to really battle these guys. They're immune to poison. They can't be frightened during the full moon. Jesus Christ. They understand common, abyssal, and infernal. 
They are a challenge rating of 13. That's not that. I mean, that's, yeah. Okay. That's, that's something. Okay. So during a full moon, they cannot be frightened and they move unnaturally. Their speed is doubled. So they can move a hundred. You've got to be kidding me. And they can take a dodge action as a bonus action. Um, they also have innate spell casting during a full moon. They can cast Hunter's Mark three times a day, Hypnotic Pattern once a day. They have legendary resistances. Oh my God. They have a running leap and with a 10 foot running start. And keep in mind, if it's a full moon, they have 100 speed, right? They have 100 movement. They can long jump 30 feet. So they could literally move 130 feet during a full, whatever. You're dead. You are friggin, you run into a lunar predator during a full moon, you're just gone. My favorite, my favorite thing that I've just read, it's called Rotting Corpses. Come with me on this journey of what happens when you're out for a midnight run during a full moon. The lunar predator always wears the dreadful remnants of its previous victim on its horns. The first time a creature that isn't an undead sees the rotting corpses, it must make a DC 17 wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, which that would be me every time, that creature takes 2d8 psychic damage is frightened for one minute. And at the end of the next turn, the creature can make another saving throw to to see if they can get out of that. So basically, you're out on your like midnight jog. It's the moonlight is, you know, lighting your way and you 130 feet jump and this dude has a dead dude tied on its horns. Yeah, I'm just going to say Yeah. You're not surviving. You, you will be on the horns of a lunar predator for the next jogger in Moonlight. I cannot wait to put together a campaign for that. Come on. It would be great over Halloween, but I don't know that we're going to have anything prepared by then. The Kickstarter did come with spell cards. It came with tarot cards. It came with a DM screen. It came with, of course, what I don't need more of, but I always like to get dice. And it came with a world map. Um, I really have enjoyed, I really enjoyed this Kickstarter. I think for a company to start a Kickstarter before COVID and then we get hit with COVID, I'm just glad I even got it. The other, yeah, I mean, I 100% would back Mana Project Studios in a future Kickstarter without a doubt. So there's that. That's Nightfell. I also received Dungeons of Dragonheim and I will probably bring that out for my next podcast. Um, Dungeon Dudes run a great stream. I'll put it in the show notes. This is the campaign book that is an accompaniment to the campaign that they've been running online for years. Uh, it came with all sorts of goodies. Like, I'm very happy with that. But the other thing that happened in my absence of podcasting, and I don't really want to totally get into this, but I want to lightly touch on it because I'm a little angry. Um, there was a company that I talked about in an earlier podcast called Apotheosis Studios. Well, it turns out these guys are complete scam artists. And essentially what was happening, I had supported their um, Red Opera Kickstarter and got the book. It's really good. Um, it's a warlock campaign. So if you like playing warlocks, I would have recommended it. So subsequently, they did an all bard campaign Kickstarter called Sirens Battles of the Bard, which I supported the Kickstarter. And it turns out these assholes were not paying their artists. They were not. Um, I, I don't want to get into the particular. You can look it up. Just look up Apotheosis Studios. And essentially, they scammed everyone who did the Kickstarter, we paid for their bogus-ass wedding, their bogus-ass cruise, and their bogus-ass company. 
Um, I don't know that I will ever see anything from Battles of the Bard. I don't know that I want to. After hearing how they've treated people, how they have just used people's work and acted like it was their own, um, particularly in the case of the Red Opera, I, I have no room for people who are assholes like that. And their behavior, like I... I had watched a stream of theirs and I'm familiar with Satine Phoenix because she's a DM and she's kind of like online so you would run into her in places and I had no feelings positive or negative about her but her partner um, who is part of Apotheosis Studio, Jameson Stone, I've never had a good feeling about this dude. Um, he just seemed like a tryhard and this whole situation has basically added him as a triard and just a jackass. And I am so angry that I supported this Kickstarter. They're not doing any refunds. And quite frankly, I just want them to pay the artists and the writers properly and them not pocket money for themselves, which is essentially what's happening. My favorite statement that they have made over the brouhaha was that Jameson was stepping back from the company to assess his behavior. Uh-huh. And then they did this post to the Kickstarter saying that after, after we investigated ourselves, we've decided that no there was no wrongdoing and anything that may have been wrongdoing, we will address. So basically, they got called out and they decided, oh, okay, so you think I did this? Well, I'll, I'll look into it. I didn't do that. Are you kidding me? What a bunch of fucking jerks. So I don't want a refund. I want the artist to be paid. I do not want my name on that book. And my name is going to be in that book because I supported the Kickstarter. I would like my name in that book under a column that, that is, I do not support the studio or the two founders of the studio. I would like artists to be paid and writers to be paid properly and accredited properly. That's what I want. So if you supported that Kickstarter, all I'm saying is, mm, I have nothing. What a bunch of jerks. Anyway, <clears throat> let's not end on that note. Maggie is snoring. Can you see Maggie? She is snoring so loudly, you guys. Okay, so that's the episode. That's what I got for you. Um, I shouldn't be ending on a bad note. Maybe Steve just edited out all the Apotha Studio. I don't know. Okay, here's the deal. I don't know how often I'm going to be podcasting for the imminent future. I've got a lot of stuff behind the scenes that is going on that is... A little bit taxing and a little bit exhausting. I'm okay. Um, I'm very public in one way and very private in another. And this is going to be an instant where I need to be private about some family things. So Steve and I are fine. Let's cheers to the fact that Steve and I have been together for 25 years, married for 15 as of yesterday. How anyone can put up with me for 20... Oh, did I say 25 years? It's 24 years together. 15 years married. How anybody can put up with this bizarreness for 24 years. Dude, I love my husband. I love Steve to death. He's the best dude ever. And so yay love. You know what? Love is what we need. Go listen to the Beyonce album. Signal Boost a Vegan. And I love you guys. I hope you all are well. I hope everything is going okay. Hang in with me. We're going to get through this. You're going to see some Elden Ring, some Skyrim, maybe some, I don't know, Generation Zero. We'll see. There'll be some gaming periodically. And I don't know. Love yourself so you can love one another. You know, take care of yourself so you can take care of one another. And if you have any, oh. If you have any tips for supplements for menopause that are vegan, put them in the comments. Yes, let's end on that note. Love you guys. See you later.